Mark Twain Selected Works Some Learned Fables Part 2 1875 Every scholar sprang to his feet pale with astonishment. Then ensued tears, handshakings, frenzied embraces, and the most extravagant jubilations of every sort. But by and by, as emotion began to retire within bounds, and reflection to return to the front, the accomplished Chief Inspector Lizard observed, But how is this? Venus should traverse the sun's surface, not the Earth's. The arrow went home. It earned sorrow to the breast of ever apostle of learning there, for none could deny that this was a formidable criticism. But tranquilly the venerable duke crossed his limbs behind his ears and said, My friend has touched the marrow of our mighty discovery, yes? All that have lived before us thought a transit of Venus consisted of a flight across the sun's face. They thought it. They maintained it. They honestly believed it, simple hearts, and were justified in it by the limitations of their knowledge. But to us has been granted the inestimable boon of proving that the transit occurs across the Earth's face, for we have seen it. The assembled wisdom sat in speechless adoration of this imperial intellect. All doubts had instantly departed like night before the lightning. The tumblebug had just intruded unnoticed. He now came reeling forward among the scholars, familiarly slapping first one and then another on the shoulder, saying, Nice, nice old boy, and smiling a smile of elaborate content. Arrived at a good position for speaking, he put his left arm akimbo with his knuckles planted in his hip just under the edge of his cutaway coat bent his right leg, placing his toe on the ground, and resting his heel with easy grace against his left shin, puffed out his aldermanic stomach, opened his lips, leaned his right elbow on Inspector Lizard's shoulder, and but the shoulder was indignantly withdrawn, and the hard-handed son of toil went to earth. He floundered a bit, but came up smiling, arranged his attitude with the same careful detail as before, only choosing Professor Dogtick's shoulder for support, opened his lips, and went to earth again. He presently scrambled up once more, still smiling, made a loose effort to brush the dust off his coat and legs, but a smart pass of his hand missed entirely, and the force of the unchecked impulse stewed him suddenly around, twisted his legs together and projected him, limber and sprawling, into the lap of the Lord Longlegs. Two or three scholars sprang forward, flung the low creature head over heels into a corner, and reinstated the patrician, smoothing his ruffled dignity with many soothing and regretful speeches. Professor Bullfrog roared out, No more of this, sir, ah, tumblebug. Say your say, and then get you about your business with speed. Quick, what is your errand? Come, move off a trifle. You smell like a stable. What have you been at? Please, <gasps> please, your worship, I chance to light upon a find. But no me <gasps> ma matter about that, there's <gasps> another find, which, <laughs> beg pardon, your honors. What was that <gasps> thing that ripped by here first? It was the Vernal Equinox. Inf <gasps> Vernal Equinox? That's all right. <gasps> uh, don't, don't know him. What, what, what's the other one? The Transit of Venus. Get, got me again, don't matter. Last one dropped something. Ah, indeed. Good luck. Good news. Quick. What, what is it? Make, mosey out and see. It'll pay. 
No more votes were taken for four and twenty hours. Then the following entry was made. The commission went in a body to view the find. It was found to consist of a hard, smooth, huge object with a rounded summit surmounted by a short, upright projection resembling a section of a cabbage stalk divided transversely. This projection was not solid, but was a hollow cylinder plugged with a soft, woody substance unknown to our region. That is, it had been so plugged, but unfortunately this obstruction had been heedlessly removed by Norway Rat, chief of the sappers and miners, before our arrival. The vast object before us, so mysteriously conveyed from the glittering domains of space, was found to be hollow and nearly filled with a pungent liquid of a brownish hue like rainwater that has stood for some time. In such a spectacle as met our view, Norway Rat was perched upon the summit engaged in thrusting his tail into the cylindrical projection, drawing it out dripping, permitting the struggling multitude of laborers to suck the end of it, then straightway reinserting it and delivering the fluid to the mob as before. Evidently, this liquor had strangely potent qualities, for all that partook of it were immediately exalted with great and pleasurable emotions, and went staggering about singing ribald songs, embracing, fighting, dancing, discharging eruptions of profanity, and defying all authority. Around us struggled a massed and uncontrolled mob, uncontrolled and likewise uncontrollable, for the whole army down to the very sentinels were mad like the rest, by reason of the drink. We were seized upon by these reckless creatures, and within the hour we, even we, were undistinguishable from the rest. The demoralization was complete and universal. In time, the camp wore itself out with its orgies and sank into a stolid and pitiable stupor, in whose mysterious bonds rank was forgotten and strange bedfellows made. Our eyes at the resurrection being blasted and our souls petrified with the incredible spectacle of that intolerable, stinking scavenger, the tumblebug and the illustrious patrician, my lord granddaddy, duke of long legs, lying soundly steeped in sleep and clasped, lovingly in each other's arms, the like whereof hath not been seen in all the ages that tradition compasseth. And doubtless none shall ever in this world find faith to master the belief of it, save only we that have beheld the damnable and unholy vision. Thus inscrutable be the ways of God whose will be done. This day, by order, did the engineer-in-chief, Herr Spider, rig the necessary tackle for the overturning of the vast reservoir, and so its calamitous contents were discharged in a torrent upon the thirsty earth, which drank it up. And now there is no more danger. We reserving but a few drops for experiment and scrutiny and to exhibit to the king and subsequently preserve among the wonders of the museum. What this liquid is has been determined. It is, without question, that fierce and most destructive fluid called lightning. It was wrested and its container from its storehouse in the clouds by the resistless might of the flying planet, and hurled at our feet as she sped by. An interesting discovery here results, which is, that lightning kept to itself is quiescent. It is the assault and contact of the thunderbolt that releases it from captivity, ignites its awful fires, and so produces an instantaneous combustion and explosion which spread disaster and desolation far and wide in the earth. 
After another day devoted to rest and recovery, the expedition proceeded upon its way. Some days later it went into camp in a pleasant part of the plain, and the savants sallied forth to see what they might find. Their reward was at hand. Professor Bullfrog discovered a strange tree and called his comrades. They inspected it with profound interest. It was very tall and straight and wholly devoid of bark, limbs, or foliage. By triangulation, Lord Longlegs determined its altitude. Herr Spider measured its circumference at the base and computed the circumference at its top by a mathematical demonstration based upon the warrant furnished by the uniform degree of its taper upward. It was considered a very extraordinary find, and since it was a tree of a hitherto unknown species, Professor Woodlouse gave it a name of a learned sound, being none other than that of Professor Bullfrog translated into the ancient Mastodon language, for it had always been the custom with discoverers to perpetuate their names and honor themselves by this sort of connection with their discoveries. Now, Professor Fieldmouse, having placed his sensitive ear to the tree, detected a rich, harmonious sound issuing from it. This surprising thing was tested and enjoyed by each scholar in turn, and great was the gladness and astonishment of all. Professor Woodlouse was requested to add to and extend the tree's name so as to make it suggest the musical quality it possessed, which he did furnishing the edition Anthem Singer, done into the Mastodon tongue. By this time, Professor Snail was making some telescopic inspections. He discovered a great number of these trees extended in a single rank with wide intervals between as far as his instrument would carry, both southward and northward. He also presently discovered that all these trees were bound together near their tops, by fourteen great ropes, one after above another, which ropes were continuous from tree to tree as far as his vision could reach. This was surprising. Chief Engineer Spider ran aloft and soon reported that these ropes were simply a web hung there by some colossal member of his own species, for he could see its prey dangling here and there from the strands. In the shape of mighty shreds and rags that had a woven look about their texture, and were no doubt the discarded skins of prodigious insects, which had been caught and eaten. And then he ran along one of the ropes to make a closer inspection, but felt a smart sudden burn on the soles of his feet, accompanied by a paralyzing shock. Wherefore he let go and swung himself to the earth by a thread of his own spinning, and advised all to hurry at once to camp, lest the monster should appear and get as much interested in the savants as they were in him and his works. So they departed with speed, making notes about the gigantic web as they went. And that evening, the naturalist of the expedition built a beautiful model of the colossal spider, having no need to see it in order to do this, because he had picked up a fragment of its vertebra by the tree, and so knew exactly what the creature looked like and what its habits and its preferences were by this simple evidence alone. He built it with a tail, teeth, fourteen legs, and a snout, and said it ate grass, cattle, pebbles, and dirt with equal enthusiasm. This animal was regarded as a very precious addition to science. It was hoped a dead one might be found to starve. Professor Woodlouse thought that he and his brother scholars, by lying head and being quiet, might maybe catch a live one. He was advised to try it, which was all the attention that was paid to his suggestion. The conference ended with the name of the monster after the naturalist, since he, after God, had created it. And improved it, mayhap, muttered the tumblebug, who was intruding again, according to his idle custom and his unappeasable curiosity. 
End of part first.